again, thanks for being here. I'd like to introduce uh, from Estes Park, Todd Burke, who um, is a science teacher at Estes Park High School. Uh, this observatory uh, works very, very closely with the Estes Park Memorial Observatory, and they in turn work very closely with Todd to um, provide outreach programs like this and to encourage students to undertake independent, important scientific uh, explorations. And that's one thing that excites me about uh, the program that Todd is going to introduce tonight. That's exactly what both our observatories are about. Huh? Well, I'm um, glad we got the people out in the uh, night of the storm, so uh, <laughs> I think you've got a cool presentation coming. Uh, he was really good, and I just want to introduce him, your guest speaker tonight. So, I teach astronomy at Ness Park. Um, we have we are a sibling, uh, a sibling observatory in that uh, Mike Fed and the volunteers here helped us in every way to uh, build the observatory up in Essence Park and we kind of aspire someday being as good as you guys are here and maybe having a bigger telescope than two towers. <laughs> yeah. 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 But um, Caden uh, participated in this program uh, and did original research with some NASA scientists and uh, published a poster session at, the, uh, at a big conference, the biggest conference in the world of astrophysicists and uh, that was just in January in Seattle, and um, he's going to continue some work next year, and he'll tell you more about that. I'll say it might be the only time that you get to hear the names of the other students, there were three of them who uh, did this last year, and the other two students are Ted Dumont and uh, Aspen Turner, and uh, they couldn't come tonight. And uh, I'll tell you that uh, Kate, in addition to playing football and wrestling and baseball, um, is a pretty impressive student. I, I really um, admire him. He hates high school so much, he just wants to do all the coolest stuff and get out as fast as possible. <laughs> he's only a sophomore, and he's done this amazing research, and he's hoping to graduate a year early, too. And um, he came up to my honors or science class as a middle school kid, and he was excited to advance a little bit and uh, find something more challenging and wanted to know if he should take the regular or science or the honors. And, of course, he took the honors or science and got a higher grade than any of the high school students. And, um, then as a freshman, he took my engineering class, and among other things, he built a seismometer we were just talking about earlier that uh, measures earthquakes all over the world. First earthquake we detected was in Micronesia. The second one was in Nicaragua, and it's built out of a slinky clay <laughs> and a PVC tube and a uh, coil of wires and some magnets and uh, such, and uploads the data to the internet uh, continually, and it's just pretty pretty cool. And he's just really uh, unusual, not just because he's hungry to do cool things and go beyond just reading a textbook and doing worksheets, but he is a problem solver. So every one of these projects ends up with you know a hundred or unforeseen challenges. We just go like, oh crap, I guess we're dead in the water. We can't do it in the right. over. Term. He just keeps working, finding ways around something. Uh, won't give up, and it's pretty impressive. Uh, so I admire him a lot. And um, I guess uh, he can tell you the rest about the uh, project. He's the only of three students who will continue it and do another year's worth of research. He's hoping to publish a paper in a scientific journal and then present that to the astrophysicists at the American Astronomical Union meeting next January in um, at Cape Canaveral in Orlando, Florida. And um, with that, I'll present to you Jaden Brown. Uh, Caden Brown, sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Caden, as Mr. Burke said, and uh, I'm here to tell you about my project of the uh, CIRCS, Spitzer Infrared Excess. And this was a NITAR program, uh, NASA IPAC Teacher Archive Research Program, which worked uh, in collaboration with uh, JPL, NASA, Caltech, and IPAC out of uh, California. And this was honestly the experience of a lifetime for me. And this picture was actually taken by my father uh, when we were in Seattle. It's the uh, Pikes Place Market Center, just four blocks from the conference center. Okay, now, how did you get in touch with these people? Did they find you? Did you find them? Did you apply? About 10 months ago, when I was in Mr. Burke's uh, engineering class as a freshman, he approached me and the other two students, Ted and Aspen, to uh, do this project, and it seemed really interesting. Cool. All right, and if anybody has any questions anytime, don't hesitate to interrupt me. All right, so this was the CIRCS team, and it was made up of five different schools with uh, across 
four different states, including Colorado. We had a school out of California, one out of, uh, two out of Massachusetts in Boston, and one from Florida. And right there was our head scientist, Farjan Gorgian, out of uh, Caltech in Pasadena. All right, so CERC stands for Spitzer Infrared Excess, and we use the Spitzer Infrared Excess catalog a lot during our project. So we mainly foc we used all data from the Spitzer Space Telescope. It was uh, launched in 2003, and it was the last of NASA's Great Space Observatories, which would be uh, similar to Hubble, which was also a Great Space Observatory. Uh, it records images in the infrared spectrum. It uh, publicly released the SEEP catalog just last summer, and we feel that we're some of the first humans to ever look at this catalog. And it has over 42 million objects, most of which were unstudied. And it has 42 million objects, most of which were unstudied, based on uh, when scientists and they get when scientists get their telescope time, they focus on one object in the center of the telescope, but in the background there are hundreds or even thousands of objects that they never care to look at or catalog or anything. And it is those that we decided would be really interesting to see if we could discover anything new. So this is the poster we presented in Seattle. And I'll look at it for a minute, but I'll go into further detail about every part of it. Okay. Yes? Uh, <coughs> infrared excess, what does that mean? It's, it's high, the, the emissions are high, I'll actually get to that in two slides, but I can sum it up real quick right now. Okay. Um, all objects with a temperature emit a black body curve, and so they emit all wavelengths of light. And towards the infrared, it should be trailing down if we can see it visibly, but instead there's a, something around the object that causes it to have another peak or a second bump. Okay. All right. <coughs> so this was our abstract. Uh, feel free to read it, and I'll sum it up in a second. Hey, how far in the infrared did your study go? Do you still cover that very well? Um, I'll actually cover it right here. We used uh, four channels, uh, 3.6, 4.5, 8, and 24 microns. And uh, to start off the project, from the 42 million objects, we just couldn't do that in the amount of time we had, which was about six-ish months after meeting with all the students and teachers. So to cull it down, we had to eliminate all objects with a signal-to-noise ratio of less than 10 sigma. And uh, signal-to-noise ratio is, uh, I can compare it kind of to a television if you just leave it on the channel, and it gets the static. The static is the noise of space. Space has the noise. And we wanted objects that we could be 100% sure were legitimate objects with uh, peer sources. So after, comp after uh, removing all objects with less than 10 sigma or higher in the, uh, with the signal to noise ratio in our four wavelengths, 3.6, 4.5, 8, and 24 microns, uh, we removed uh, objects from the galactic plane as well as uh, formerly named survey regions with greater than 1,000 objects just because we felt that these objects had been likely studied already and were therefore not as interesting as the undiscovered ones. Uh, then we plotted our uh, remaining sources. It was about 58,000 on a color-color plot and took the outliers in order to uh, compare them to literature and figure out which ones were undiscovered and had infrared excess. All right, so getting back to your question, sir, infrared excess uh, so, like I said, all objects with temperature emit a uh, black body curve, which is shown right here. And the peak is the most uh, intense wavelength of light that it emits. And this is dependent on temperature as well as variable other things. And it's, it peaks and then it slopes down what we call a Raleigh gene curve. And the Raleigh gene curve should look exactly like this, but in other cases it looks... Oh, sorry. It looks more it either has a broader slope or it has a second little bump caused by usually a dust accretion disk around it. Like I said, depending on the temperature of an object, it will emit a different peak intensity of uh, wavelength of light. 
and this purple line right here is a 5,000 degrees Kelvin and it is the most similar out of these three to our sun in that it peaks roughly around the green area and fun fact our sun is technically green in the visible spectrum but because our eyes are imperfect the rods and cones inside of them the blue and green uh, rods and cones they cross talk with each other so they kind of almost cancel out the green by adding some more blue in there so it appears more yellow all right so once again this is the Raleigh gene curve of just a bare star with nothing around it and a star with a continuous dusk disk will have a broader slope which is harder to detect for our infrared excess and the star with a dust belt around it uh, so you'll see the normal Raleigh gene curve but then right where you hit the dust right there the dust will absorb and then re-emit the uh, energy at different wavelengths of light as you can see with the second little bump. Kaden, yes. It could be any type of dust belt okay. and dust accretion. All right, so this was the workflow from our project. So we had to cool down the 42 million sources with the SNR. So we had about uh, 1.1 million sources. Then after we removed the galactic plane, we had about 300,000 sources. Uh, then through removing survey tracks, we were left with only 58,000 sources. Uh, then after that, we plotted them on color color plots and selected our outliers. Uh, then test and then we had 112 outliers and tested them further. All right, so the 42 million sources down to 58,000 sources by removing objects with signal to noise ratio of less than 10 sigma or higher, uh, removing the galactic plane and removing all surveys with greater than a thousand objects. Uh, through crowdsourcing among all of the different students as well as teachers that worked on this topic, we used a Google Drive document, basically an Excel sheet that was synced in the cloud that we all had access to. And we looked at all these uh, 58,000, uh, we looked at all 112 outliers through uh, a cutout server. So we basically saw the raw images that Spitzer took and we were able to determine whether or not these were actual legitimate objects or not or if they were in a crowded field or missing in one of our wavelengths or uh, were just not really even objects themselves. We call those artifacts. All right, so this is a color color plot and you'll notice the yellow. The yellow are our 112 outlier sources and you may notice some blue up there by the outliers that you sh think should be yellow but we determined these to either be in a crowded field, artifacts, or were missing in a channel so we threw them out. All right, so color to an astronomer. All right, so color is the uh, ratio of two different wavelengths of light. It's the intensity of one wavelength of light over another intensity. So these are the actual uh, filters that Spitzer itself used. Uh, three, we used the uh, four, 3.6, 4.5, 8, and 24. And it also had another three at 5.8, 70, and 160. But we used uh, those four, and you can see here that a filter is basically put on the uh, photoreceptor so that it only allows so much of the wavelengths of light in this narrow little spectrum, and all other light is uh, not absorbed, so it doesn't detect it, and that's how it's able to get the precise numbers at the special wavelength. All right, and here is highlighting a, a visible image versus an assigned color infrared image of M51 Whirlpool Galaxy. And you can notice subtle differences that are very important though to astronomers. For instance, in the infrared, you'll notice a lot more background objects than you would in the visible, as well as a lot more makeup in this uh, seemingly black space on the visible spectrum. All right, so a color-color plot is a plot of two different colors with one on the x-axis and one on the y-axis. Uh, this was used in our project to clearly distinguish sources with infrared excess from those that did not have any. And here you can see the two main distributions are that lump and that lump right there. And the ones closer to zero are dimmed, are dubbed more Vega-like because Vega is what scientists use to make the ideal black body curve. All right, so once again, back to the workflow. After plotting them on the color color, we had 112 sources that were outliers, and 22 of those we deemed not to be okay, which became the blue dots again. 
So we're left with 90 of those yellow dots, 90 sources that were legitimate. We then, <coughs> excuse me, we then went through Ned and Simbad databases in order to uh, see if we could find literature of uh, scientists that already studied these objects. And we found 22 that had been listed and had uh, been looked at before, but 68 of them had not been. And of the 22 sources, we uh, went through the papers that had been published, and seven of those had not reported infrared excess. So in total, with the 68, we got 76 newly recognized infrared excess objects. We then plotted these on a magnitude uh, histogram based on their magnitude in the I2 channel, which is the 4.5 uh, wavelength of light. And we found a bimodal distribution and all the ones in this first little hump we deem to be inside of our galaxy, so most likely stars or young stellar objects. And all of those in the second massive hump we deem to be extragalactic. All right, so this little chart, it might be hard to see, but there's a gray line right here, following right there. And this first hump seems to be a lot bigger than the second one, but this is all 42 million objects in the Spitzer and Hammond Imaging Products catalog plotted on the same histogram. And you can see just how many of those 42 million are actually inside of our own galaxy. And it seems that most of the sources that we kept, which were the green, were kept on the second hump from the original 42 million. All right, then going back to uh, this slide, you'll see it again right there. The green was the blue, it's the line of best fit, and the yellow are actual objects. And you can kind of see somewhere in this middle zone are a lot of objects. So these were also labeled on our poster as uh, kind of in-between objects. All right, so then we found six uh, randomly picked sources just to make spectral emission diagrams, which is basically the Raleigh gene curve based on just the uh, original wavelengths of light. And I feel the best one is object number 52, which would be this left box. You can kind of see it would peak over here, curve down, and then pop back up for its infrared excess. And that's exactly what we were looking for. All right, so once again, those, from those 76, we did the rough classification. We found four inside of our own galaxy, 23 ambiguous, which would be that little middle zone, and 65 were extra galactic. So the accomplishments for the previous year were that we isolated over 59,000 strong infrared excess sources. Nearly all these objects are brand new discoveries. And we also presented all these findings at a poster session at the 2015 American Astronomical Union Conference in Seattle. Hey, yes. Question on the previous slide. Yes. The extra galactic sources, what, what do you think they are? I mean, I can see we can see a lot of stars in our own galaxy. Right. But it's hard to see individual stars in other galaxies. Are you looking at galaxies, basically, the extra galactic sources? The extra galactic sources, uh, that's part of what the work I'm doing this year is to find, and so far through my findings, I've found that a vast majority are actually galaxies. Sure. Okay. All right. Hey, hey uh, why, why, how do, you, how do you go about identifying the extra galactic? I mean, uh, is it because of the frequency shift? You know, why are there two pumps there? Uh, that, the two humps were based sheerly off of magnitude, so we did a rough relative magnitude of the two, and to do the absolute magnitude, we actually have to schedule scale telescope time to be able to look at the two. Very rough classification. So, so, so you're looking at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the relative magnitude, yes. and you're saying the guys that are higher magnitude Correct. All right, so this was actually taken at Seattle at our AAS conference. And this is all three of us and Mr. Burke at the poster. All right, so the next steps, uh, what I'm continuing on in the project is to identify as many objects in the color color plot as can be found in the current literature through cross-referencing uh, all of these objects through uh, databases such as Ned and Simbad. And we also, the entire group wants to gain telescope time for some follow-up spectroscopy instead of just photometry. 
And we want to publish a catalog that uh, astrophysical researchers can use to kind of guess the probability of what uh, their object is likely to be just based off of its position in a color-color diagram. All right, so if you'll notice this again, this is a color-color plot, and it should look fairly familiar to the last one with the basically four little butterfly quadrants. And for the past month or so, I've been studying the upper, light, upper right uh, region, and I've been cross-referencing it through Simbad and Ned. And so far, 60% are galaxies through Simbad, and the rest uh, are basically all either X-ray sources or radio sources, leading me to believe that they're also galaxies. Did you watch Lang Simbad? I mean, the acronym? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. All right, so basically the difference between what I'm doing now and what we've done in the past is instead of just finding all these outliers and cross-referencing them and looking for literature, <laughs> I'm taking the 58,000 sources and directly going down here to classify them, but not by their magnitude, uh, hopefully by spectroscopy through telescope time as well as just through current literature. All right, thank you. Of course. So basically, all objects, uh, not just the galaxies, when they're emitting this infrared excess, it's a very short period of time in their uh, stellar evolutionary life, which, I mean, for us as humans, their lives could be millions or billions of years long. And this period could only be 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. We don't know. But it's a very short window into looking at the stars and actually, or stellar objects, my bad, and uh, seeing what they're doing right now. All right, so in the beginning, we had uh, rough classifications for these objects. We had four categories. The first one was uh, young stellar objects, uh, active galactic nuclei, uh, and we also had a mystery category for things that we just had no idea what could be. But those were the two main categories that we decided to focus on. Stellar and active galactic. Yes. Uh, through that scientist, Varjan Gorjian, we're hoping that through some of his connections, uh, the teachers as well as some of us students can get some telescope time to do some spectroscopy. Would you go out there? Or it would probably be remote. Cool. Uh, Kate, uh, when you get these data points for a star from Spitzer, yes. is that just a snapshot in time or is that like an average of multiple uh, measurements? What is that actually that you're looking at? Uh, it would just be the snapshot in time from the background of when the scientists were studying the uh, middle object, and it was in the background. Okay, so it's like sec secondary objects. Yes. Okay, Worked. It's got nothing to do with astronomy, but tell everybody what you're doing next summer. Really nice. All this summer? All right. So this summer, I'm actually interning at CU in the mechanical engineering department. And I'm working with some grad students to develop an endoscope to, be look, to look inside of a rat's brain. It's a millimeter in diameter to look inside the rat's brain when it's having a seizure. And to, uh, it will emit some wavelengths of light as well as be able to capture data on uh, calcium, which is a uh, neurotransmitter that is released during seizures and just normal neuron function and they're going to tag it so that it will bioluminesce when we hit it with a certain wavelength of light. And the coolest part about it would have to be the uh, lens itself is a liquid and it's a microelectrical mechanical system and the lens will have to be able to 
change its uh, what's called tilt tilt so it'll be a prism and change its direction to pan inside of the rat's brain as well as be able to focus differentially to see different areas of the brain and this will have to be done through the use of electricity on the surface of the liquid because when you drop a liquid on a surface you know it kind of bubbles up if it's polar but if you electrically charge the surface that you put the liquid on it changes what's called the contact angle of it so the liquid will kind of melt down farther and that's how you can get different lenses out of the liquid is that how your eyeball your lens works right yes so my question isn't that smart but when did you decide you liked science <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> let's see It'd probably be in eighth grade for sure when I took Mr. Burke's earth science class because before then I kind of just took science because I had to <laughs> but then it turned out I was pretty good at it so then I got better at it and started to love it. I got a related question. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, Murphy's Law is always going to be there, so. Yeah. But this is really amazing. I mean, this spacecraft was launched in 2003, right? Spitzer. Yes. I worked on Spitzer pre incarnation starting in 1983. So it was a long labor observatory going. Because Hubble was starting to overrun at time, and the budget was being cut. So, I mean, five or six times NASA voted to cut to the Spitzer Space Telescope out of the budget. And every time again, Bolt came back and Boulder with new proposals to make it smaller, to make it cheaper, to make it better. It's kind of interesting. And now, all of a sudden, we got the Chandra Observatory that we worked on as well, the X ray Observatory that, that needed budget. So it's, it's kind of almost impossible to predict why Spitzer even flew, but ultimately they found some budget and built it fairly cheaply. So I'm glad to see the results finally. I mean, that's 30 some years later. And it's an amazing year story about how yeah. it survived after the crash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is Spitzer still up there? Is it doing anything? I don't think it is active anymore. No, it's very active. It's, still mm -hmm. it's very active with only one instrument working. So. You want to explain a little bit about what the project mission is? Okay, well, when Spitzer went up, it needed to remain at 4 degrees Kelvin. And to do that, it had to have liquid helium on board to cool it down. All right, so Spitzer... All right, so Spitzer has three different arrays. It had uh, the Iraq, MIPS, and Burke. Do you know the other one? Not right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so for those t some of them to work at, and function at the wavelength they did, they needed to remain at uh, 4 degrees Kelvin, uh, very cold. And to do that, they used liquid helium to cryogenically f keep them cool. But uh, back in, I think it was 2009, the liquid helium ran out. And so uh, four diff they only have two different wavelengths of light. The 80 and the 170 are still working at a balmy 30 degrees Kelvin. So the other ones, uh, the instruments are too warm to work properly. And I think they're currently able to use the one instrument MIPS is still going. MIPS, is, a, is it MIPS shut down, actually? MIPS, MIPS was on the University of Arizona. Dr. George Ricci was the principal. You know, it's larger wavelength. That's the larger way. Yeah, so it's still running. They're using the Exoplanet. It's actually the mm -hmm. best instrument right now to find Exoplanet. The interesting design on the space on the telescope is what it's. I know. 
had a, had a pointer. I'll give you guys a little idea how it was designed and why it was designed this way. Okay. 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 And SIMBAD stands for the set of identifications, measurements, and bibliography for astronomical data. <laughs> so basically, you see the telescope here. I think it was a 60 centimeter optic, I think. Or was it a one meter optic? There were two designs that we worked on. So here, two or three feet optic, basically, about that size telescope. And behind the telescope is the Cryo tank, which also acts as a buffer because the solar panel is on the outside of the cryo tank, so that points to the sun. So the cryo tank gets shielded from the sun by the solar panel, and the telescope gets as cold as possible because it's shielded again by the cryo tank, as well as cooled by the cryo uh, liquid. And then here you got two star trackers for navigation. Kind of cool, cool system. It was liquid helium? Yeah. Yeah, neat, uh, neat instrument. Great presentation, Katie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. For Katie. Um, unbelievably, it's clear outside. <laughs> Orion Nebula is yeah. glorious. So I think we're going to start up the telescope again and give everybody a chance to go look at, uh, at space. Katie, thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Thank you. Thanks,